السلام علیکم جی آئے نو پخیر آغلے نی ہاو ما چونے شمے وش ملے او ہائے گنز آئی مز گوٹن مارگن پری ویدن ہائے ہگز ان ہیلوز ٹو ایوری بری ہوس ٹیون انٹو پی ٹی ور رائی ناو انڈا واشنگ وال دس مارننگ لانگ سے شہزاد خان آئی ہوپ دیٹ یو گائز ار پرفیکٹ ڈوئنگ ویل اٹس ٹائم ٹو رائز ان شائنگ ویک ان بیک ان گیٹ گوئنگ ان یو نو فور آل اف دوز گولز وچ یو تھاٹ دیٹ یو گوئنگ ٹو اچیو ان 2017 پلیز میک شور دیٹ نتھنگ از گوئنگ ٹو افیکٹ دیم and that you're going to get up every day dress up and show up because that's the energy we want in you and we want you to be you know successful in every walk of life so for all those people who are out there you know blessings from our side from our team let's get started with the show ladies and gentlemen today it's going to be a very superb show because of the fact that you know we have go- we are going to have like two segments in the first one we're going to talk about something which you can only practice if the second part is there. I mean, wow. So, you know, you should be anticipating what we'll be talking in the second segment as well. But first things first, you know that, you know, we pick up fruit of the day, but today we've got something very different. It's one of my very favorite dishes as well. You know, it's a good protein source and, uh, you know, winters, whenever winters are around, this is what you're probably looking for. So let's see, what do we have for today? And the benefits will follow. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about fish, which, is, which definitely belongs to the vertebra family of the animals as well. But talking about the benefits of fish, it reduces risk of heart disease, fight against asthma, cancer, and diabetes as well, anti-inflammatory condition, improve skin and hair, boost brain development, good for eyesight, reduces Alzheimer's risk as well, so it's good for brain in short, but reduces depression and promote bone health. And it's a good source of protein as well. So ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't got a chance to, you know, eat fish, what you probably need to do is that you probably need to take out your car, go somewhere over here in Pakistan. You know, we've got immense variety of fish over here as well. And for example, if you go to Jeel Saiful Muluk or wherever, you know, you would see people, you know, with their carts and everything that, you know, okay, fresh fish, Bashir ki fish and, you know, whatnot. So there are different brands as well, Rahu's there, and there are different types. So we are, thanks to Allah that, you know, we live in a country where you can probably, be, you have access to all types of fish. And then, you know, there are two types of fish as well. And, you know, talking about then one, obviously, which comes from the farm, and then the second, which is from the river or the sea as well itself. And there, in Karachi, when I used to be in Karachi, and I've spent five years in Karachi, what we used to do was that we used to hire a boat go deep sea and then start fishing and then just eat it. And then the best part of fishing is, for example, if you're fishing and if you've got a rod, you know, and you know, it starts clinging and you know that the fish is coming. So once you take it out, you put it in a net and then put it in the water till the time you're, you know, not hungry. So what, for example, if you're going to be hungry in like half an hour's time or an hour's time, you're going to take it out, cook it and fresh fish, wow, the meat, it's just delicious. So, you know, if you get a chance, please go ahead with fish as well. And for all those people, you know, who are gym lovers as well, you know, they probably seek towards having fish quite a lot of time. And, and, and then half of the time, you know, what we have done is that, you know, recently we have started this as well, that we have started wishing birthdays. So one of our very dear colleague, his name is Malik Janaid Khalid. Uh, it's his birthday today, so we want to wish him. So Janaid, that's a shout out to you. Happy birthday to you. May you have many more. But you're getting older, bro. You know, you need a hair transplant as well now. So please make sure that you guys are intact. And then, you know, at the same time, it's Numan Shaquille's birthday. He's a great fan of world this morning. So Numan Shaquille, happy birthday. It's a shout out to you. And, you know, you can obviously haul us back as well. So Numan Shaquille, happy birthday to you. May you have many more. I'm sorry that I literally do not know the birthday song, but it's perfectly all right. Now, I think enough of the birthdays. For all those people who are celebrating their birthdays today, happy birthday. May you have many more, may you prosper, and you know, all the best for your future endeavors. Now, moving on, getting on with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, over here in Pakistan, we have seen that, you know, there's a trend that most of the time, for example, when you're done with your college or A-levels, parents tell their kids, okay, you know, be an engineer, be a doctor. And the last most might probably be, if you're not that bright, okay, be a marketing student or, you know, any discipline within the business. Now, what happens over here is that, you know, if you do not agree with your parents that, okay, I don't want to be an engineer or a doctor, they might probably just get angry with you for a while and then things will settle. So then there are people who are standing against all these odds. Especially for women, it's quite difficult because for women, it is considered that, you know, being a doctor is just the only best part of their life. And then they'll get a good rishta as well and whatnot. So there are people who are breaking barriers. And then as I said, that the second part, whatever we're going to discuss in it, 
is basically what actually enables all of us to work in this society which we call governance. So ladies and gentlemen, today we are picking up on a career which I think is going to be a good one in the days to come because we are a developing country and there's quite a lot of development going on all around the globe. So we have picked up on architecture and I've been joined by a wonderful architect whose name is Ms. Zehra Aziz. Hello Zehra, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam, hello. Good, good morning. morning, thank you yeah. very much for joining us. So do you like fish or you don't? I like fish. Oh, you like yes, fish? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much for saying that. I like it too. Okay, but barbecued, fried or what? Um, I, I liked it baked. <laughs> oh, baked? Uh, yes. Well, I haven't had a baked fish in years though. Yeah. And then you It's know, healthy. The, yeah, it is healthy. Mm -hmm. And then, the, you know, sushi? No sushi? No, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yeah, I mean, there are people who certainly like sushi, then there are people who do not like it. Okay, but, so architect. Yes. What made you an architect? I mean, no, you, I mean, you might have had the opportunity to be a doctor, to be an engineer. And then, you know, what I was saying prior to that, mm -hmm. the parents want their daughters to be doctors. That's it. So yeah. what made you an architect? Um, I think I was, um, I used to enjoy arts and sciences yeah. uh, as subjects during school. And architecture is a good blend of the two subjects. Right. Um, I was also lucky enough uh, to travel. Uh, and uh, that gave me a lot of exposure to different architecture. Amazing. So um, knew a few architects, uh, thought they, were, they had uh, very cool jobs and uh, were their own bosses. So a lot of things led to me deciding uh, that I want to do architecture as when, a profession. And then what was the first response you got from your family? Oh, architect? Um, my father is uh, from the engineering background, okay. so he's worked with architects. And uh, uh, I got a lot of support and basically the decision was my own in the end. And uh, I got a good opportunity to go to Turkey to study architecture. Wow. So, so everything worked out well in the end. Amazing yeah. that is. Yeah. I mean, that means that you've got a good support system at home as well. Absolutely. And if yes. you don't mind me asking, for how long have you been an architect now? Uh, so I have been an architect for six years. Six years? Yes, yes. Yes. So you, and I've been working in the field. Okay, before, before we discuss about, you know, whether it's a good field to, to be in over mm -hmm. here in Pakistan or not. Yes. What I want to ask you is, for example, for all those people who want to construct a building or a house or whatever, since the yeah. development's taking place, mm -hmm. what are the questions they should have in their head while picking up an architect? Because over here in Pakistan, we certainly do not see, you know, that people would go after architects. I mean, they would mm -hmm. make their own drawings. Okay, you know, four pillars here, four pillars here, a mm -hmm. roof, and that's it, gone. And whenever there's earthquake, because we are prone to that as well, okay, the building's gone now. Yeah. That's just because of the fact that they didn't hire a good engineer or an architect. So how is it over here? I think um, it, it really depends uh, from yeah. project to project, uh, but uh, I think you should go for an architect who listens to you and understands you and tries to uh, figure out what you want yeah. and gives you original solutions. Okay, um, okay, that's great. But you know, half of the time, obviously, when you, whenever you're going to go out to hire somebody, yes. you know, they'll listen to you because, you know, they're there and you know that, you know, they, they might be my prospect, you know, yeah. clients as well. Hmm. So I think the questions which you certainly think that these are the questions which people should ask, which they don't even, what are those questions? Well, uh, experience is one. Okay. Um, uh, creativity is another one. And... Um, uh, you can see an architect's work, the work that they've been doing yeah. in the market. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and plus uh, a personal, uh, because architecture is a kind of profession that uh, you need to really get to know the user. Yeah. So, um, so getting to know the part uh, is also. It is. So it, you certainly have to sit down and talk for hours yes. and then decide that okay, yes. this is what we're going to do. Yes. Okay, but because end of the day, you have to be comfortable in, in the space that yeah. is being designed for you. Exactly. And yes. generally, you know, there's an idea that people think that, for example, if they're going to hire an architect, it's yeah. going to be very expensive. Now, but can you tell them that, you know, whenever you hire an architect, they might make you save a lot of money as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so we're relatively new in the market, so yeah. we're establishing a name. Yeah. So I can say that we're reasonable. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the concept is changing. People are realizing that an architect plays a very important role exactly. uh, in, in the design process. So um, that is the value for money that, that you're paying. And it, he, will end, he or she will end up uh, saving you exactly. uh, in terms of costs. And Only if you will consider that, you know, because they'll be telling you these materials to be used and, you know, we can probably, you know, this pillar is not needed or this or that. Yes. So you'll save a lot of money. 
but since I was researching last night as well, mm -hmm. so I was like, okay, you know, what questions to be asked from an architect? Okay. So, for example, whenever, ladies and gentlemen, you're hiring an architect, so these are the top most five questions which you should ask, and I'm going to ask Zara these five questions. Okay. What's your role on a project? Well, um, so the design process, uh, we, we actually, we start the, uh, by questioning the client yeah. uh, on what they want. Uh, and then we uh, start sketching ideas and uh, possibilities uh, that are, would suit the uh, client. Yeah. And uh, we then make, take that process and convert it into a more buildable uh, language. Um, so something that you can take and to a contractor. That's and, and a great start. answer. 10 yeah. out of 10. Wow, fabulous. Yeah. Okay, so this is the first question. If you're hiring an architect, this is what you were supposed to ask. What's your role on a project? She answered it. Superb. Okay. How do you design a home for a modern family? Well, first of all, getting to know the family is very important. Modern family. Yes. Uh, you need to know their lifestyle. Yeah. And uh, a modern family, I would expect them to be experimental. Yeah. Um, so you give them uh, something new, uh, something... I mean, liberal, open to ideas. You yes. Know, things like these. Yes. Very nice. Yes. Okay. So what rooms are important but get overlooked? I think uh, the common areas, uh, for example, the living spaces. Yeah, you uh, said it lounge. right. Wow. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and so that is the most important space. The laundry area. Yeah, people concentrate more on the formal area, yeah, 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 like yeah, the drawing yeah, yeah. room yeah. or um, uh, or the kitchen. master bedroom yes. or the kitchen. Yes. yes, kitchen is also very important. Okay. Um, so the common areas where everybody has to come together, they are the most important spaces in the house. Very nice. Yes. Okay, so do you think that in days to come, because over here the type of houses we build, I mean we we. We make sure that they are humongous in size and then there's mm -hmm. no extra space left mm -hmm. and then there's no sunlight coming in. Yeah. I get stressed with it. I mean, I do not like the type of houses we make over here in Pakistan mm -hmm. because whenever you travel somewhere abroad, they might have like half of the area is constructed and half of it is like just land and you can sit over there. Yeah. Do you think that these things are going to revolutionize, you know, gradually? Because people do not certainly like the idea of leaving the space empty over here in Pakistan. Yeah. They're like, whatever you have, you know, double basement, basement, you know, all the floors on top of it. So we generally do not get that space to probably, you know, get escape. Well, uh, there are, um all sorts of trends in Pakistan uh, right now. So there's one group of people who are building taller and uh, maximizing Humongous, yeah. space, yeah. yeah. And then there's another uh, group of people who are going towards traditional forms of yeah. architecture, um, which is about uh, verandas and courtyards and uh, mixing the indoor spaces with the outdoor spaces. Exactly. So, um, so you cannot generalize uh, it into one, but yes, it is a problem. Uh, people do want to cover the entire plot of land and just build a lot of bedrooms. Uh, but then when you start living in them, yeah. you realize that you may not need uh, this, uh, this much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, until yeah. unless it's a joint family system, your grandparents are with you or you know, you've got, got a lot of guests to come in. I mean, that's obviously for sure. But other than that, I mean, if you're planning that, you know, you're just a couple and, you know, you might get married and you're going to have three sons, you know, in the next three decades and then they're going to get married and then their family is mm -hmm. going to live with us, that future planning is fine. Okay, but right now, ladies and gentlemen, since we have been in conversation with Zara, so you might be thinking that what type of work she's done. Because we have got her pictures over here and they'll be on your television screens in one, two, tell me what, three. Yeah, um, tell so us about it. I'm part of a firm called Particles, yeah. uh, and this is a project that we recently completed. Oh, this is, this is a farmhouse that uh, we are designing uh, in Kashmir, wow. um, and it will just start construction in it's a few more months. more of glass. Yes, yes. Less it's, of concrete. Uh, it's, very, it's on long modern lines. Oh, this wow. is a project that we did for a competition. Uh, it's a, a school project uh, for an organization called Ham Kadam, okay. and uh, earthquake resistant and this is a house uh, that is uh, that has been designed in Banigala. So it's on top of a hill, high roofs, uh, modern finishes. There's a big artwork. This is on the house the wall. for modern family. Yes. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, again, this is the same project, uh, Chal Foundation. Uh, it's a it's a com uh, it's an organization that um, makes prosthetics uh, for okay. disabled people uh, and helps them uh, rehabilitate. So this is one of the areas in the project. Okay, so this is 
same farmhouse uh, so back in Kashmir, yes. Uh, this is a winter courtyard of that farmhouse. So this is just one courtyard? <laughs> there are multiple courtyards in this house. Yes. Exactly, yes. because it's a farmhouse, okay. right? Okay, so this is from Chalna. This is from Chal Foundation again. This is a conference room. As so you can what, see, you can see... What's with this roof, you know, all of those pipes hanging and you know... So, so everything is exposed in this project. Uh, also, it helps saving costs yeah. uh, and maintenance. And then the uh, walls as well, they're, they're a bit like not well done. No, it, it, they're exposed, so, okay. so you can see the brick finish, uh, you can see all the pipe work. Uh, and then it looks fantastic as well, and then at the same time you save a lot of cost. Yes. Okay, this one. So that's the farmhouse again. This is the farmhouse, this is the study wow. area of that farmhouse. Um, so you can get beautiful views from both sides. Yeah, so either you can concentrate on your book or probably the view as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> again, this is uh, one of the spaces in this the office. The yes. Okay, so architecture, do you think all of those architects were there and then they're designing things for people? They are responsible for each and everything? Well, architecture is uh, teamwork. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of consultants and uh, people, stakeholders involved yeah. in making a project. Uh, so it's not just the architect, it's the contractor, it's the structure engineer. Uh, it's How the do you guys get engineer. along with the contractor? I think that's the most difficult part, right? Well, that is part of our job, getting along with people. Yeah. So we have to get along with the clients, we have to get along with the contractor. Communication is very important. And then whenever you give a deadline to somebody and then, you know, the delays are because of the contractor or probably somebody else, how do you manage it? We manage the design end of... Uh, of that we've done it, you know, so you, it's not our responsibility. We, we, no, we do take responsibility okay. and we keep track and, uh, I mean... So every time, that means, you know, the only reason why I ask you is that yeah. that means that you have to be on, on your toes. Absolutely. Majority of, most of the time. That's how we can say, because Azad Kashmir, there's a project going somewhere else, there's a project going yes. outside Pakistan, there's a project going. Yes. So now that's where I wanted to bring the conversation. Now for women, especially, what type of a field is architecture and do you think it's very favorable or the people outside with whom you get to sit and talk and work? For example, these contractors and all of the stakeholders, do you think it's safe? Yes, it's, it's safe. Uh, I mean, I've been working in the field for a good five years now, and uh, um, there's a lot of scope. Uh, so it depends, uh, architect, you can innovate uh, yeah. staying within the profession. Exactly. So you can be a writer, you can be an artist, you can uh, be an interior designer. Yeah. So it depends on what, on the on your capacity to deal with these different aspects of So you will the recommend field. that architecture is the thing to do now, for, even for women or for men as well, or boys or girls, whoever wants you to do You need it. to have uh, passion Aesthetic to do it. Aesthetic sense as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, passion and motivation is very important because the money... Well, why are you saying it? Why are you saying it that passion and motivation is required? Because uh, I think a lot of uh, times people choose professions on the basis of uh, different reasons. Yeah. Um, so, for example, money is a reason. But in our profession, the money comes much later. How, uh, how late? Like when your hair starts growing gray or but something. But it does come in. And it when it come comes in. in, it comes in. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so all the very best, Zara. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming over. Thank you very much for, you know, spending time with us, sharing all of your views. Yeah. And it was fantastic being in Thank conversation you. with you. So ladies and gentlemen, okay, so this is one of those fields where you can obviously put in all the hard work, but with passion, dedication and motivation because, you know, the money, yes, does comes in. But you know, when your hair starts to fall. So if you're already bald, I think it's not an option <laughs> for you. Well, I'm just kidding, but thank you very much, Zara, once thank again. You. Ladies and gentlemen, right now at this point of time, we're going to go for a short break. Don't go anywhere because we'll be right back. Because just, you know, this governance part, which I was telling you initially, Zara is able to work just because of the fact that good governance is there. Whether it is or not, I'm able to work just because of the fact that, you know, there's equality within the system you know, within the society. Now, that's what we're going to discuss in the later half of the show. Don't go anywhere because it's going to be a very crucial and intense conversation. Stay tuned. Good morning.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. For everybody who just got tuned into PTY, you were watching World This Morning and on Sir Shahzad Khan. And initially in the first phase of the show, we were talking about architecture as a field, as a career as well. And Ms. Zara Aziz spoke very well. And she said that, you know, it needs passion and dedication. Now, you know, at the start of the show, I mentioned that, you know, for example, if I'm a host, I'm an anchor person, and I'm working over here in Pakistan, that means that somebody's pro protecting my rights. Somebody's given me this freedom. You know, my fundamental rights are in place. For example, if Ms. Zara Aziz is practicing whatever she wants to practice, that means that, you know, she's getting uh, all of that, what she needs probably as a citizen of Pakistan. And it is all done with the help of governance and then later on good governance. So this is something which we might have to decide, but since we're a morning show, we're not political, we're talking about democratic governance. Now, democratic governance, obviously, you know, it's the government's responsibility to provide, you know, all those facilities which are going to make us healthy. Obviously, that means health, then education, then rule of law, and then equality. But, you know, just to give you an idea, a brief idea of what democratic governance is, I'm going to play a video for you guys, and when you guys are going to come back, we'll be in conversation with somebody who plays a very advisory role, that these are the loopholes, these are the things which can be done. They work hand-in-hand in hand with the local governments. They work hand-in-hand hand with the federal government as well. So, you know, that's what we are doing today. I'm very excited. Go ahead, first of all, take a look at this video and understand what democratic governance is. Right now, communities across the globe want governments to be honest and responsive. Global surveys indicate that together with education and health, this ranks among the highest priorities for the world we want. A government that protects human rights and freedoms, guarantees inclusive and sustainable growth, and allows peoples to live with dignity, in peace and security. There is respect for the rule of law. Everyone is able to demand justice, challenge discrimination, and exercise their rights. These rights include environmental rights that protect the interests and livelihoods of local and indigenous communities. Using public resources in a transparent manner creates trust between the state and its people, prevents corruption, and protects resources for development. New technologies and social networking can ensure that remote communities freely gain access to information that can change their lives. Democratic governance leads to inclusive participation in society and allows people to choose their representatives freely and peacefully. Legitimate political institutions provide the space for civic engagement and for the peaceful management of conflict and tensions. At the local level, democratic governance ensures that government is close to the people and that solutions to development challenges involve all social groups. Practiced by honest and accountable governments, democratic governance is a feature of safe, peaceful, and resilient societies. Societies that are able to reduce poverty, inequality, and exclusion, and foster economic growth in a sustainable manner. This is the world we want. All right, so definitely this is the world we want, but are we living in a world which we thought that is going to be like this? But there are people who are playing a very advisory role all around the globe, and I think I'm going to introduce to you, you know, that guy who's over here is a fantastic um, a human being, and he's none other than Mr. Amir Gurai, who's the assistant country director UNTP Pakistan, which is United Nations Development Program Pakistan. Hello, sir. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Thank you very much, uh, Shahzad. Thank you very I'm, much for I'm joining joining hands with us as well. Thank you very much for coming over to elaborate on the role of UNDP Pakistan as well. So what is your role? Because, you know, we just have like 10, 15 minutes. So we want the most of the information to come up. Well, uh, UNDP Pakistan is uh, one of the oldest partners of the government of Pakistan, okay. actually the state of Pakistan, yeah. to improve governance, to improve livelihoods, and to uh, fight uh, any kind of disasters in Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, there are four major areas we're working in, democratic governance, crisis prevention and recovery, uh, climate change and environment, wow. and uh, uh, development policy. Okay. Uh, the way we look at uh, governance, uh, the way we see ourselves, uh, UNDP, is uh, as the advisors to the state of Pakistan, okay. to the government of Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, we provide uh, uh, expertise, uh, we provide facilitation, uh, we work very closely uh, with the state institutions and ultimately uh, we would uh, like to contribute towards institutions uh, which respond to the needs of the people of Pakistan. Very nice. So you, it's more of an advisory role. So it's not like that you're pushing something onto the institutions. No, I mean, I'm, you'll say that, you know, this is good for you. For example, just like parents do. Okay, if you're going to study, you're going to get a good job. They can only say it. They cannot push you, right? Is it like that? I would say the, the, the parent in this case would be the government and yeah, the state. Obviously. We, are, we are the ones who are, who are the facilitators. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, what we do, I mean, in democratic governance, uh, we work with the state institutions. The institutions yeah. we work with uh, is the government of Pakistan, the election commission of Pakistan, yeah. the provincial governments. Exactly. And also, you know, the civil society organizations. All right. In doing so, uh, with the election commission of Pakistan, we are one of the uh, oldest partners of the election commission of Pakistan. We provide training uh, to the uh, election officials. There's a demand side and then there's a supply side as there's well, There's a right? demand side and yeah. there's a uh, supply side. Exactly. Uh, for rule of law, we work uh, very closely with the rule of law institutions across the justice chain. Because as we see, uh, that for rule of law, it is very important that the rule of law actors are coordinating with each other. Exactly. Okay, I'm going to stop you over here. Okay, let's just discuss it briefly, you know, one by one. For example, you just talked about that, you know, like you guys are working with Election Commission. You've been working for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So on the demand side, obviously, we get voters' education. Mm -hmm. What projects or, or what programs have been undertaken for voters' education that, you know, obviously... And we have seen that every time, whenever mm -hmm. there has been mm -hmm. election, you know, there's a greater population coming mm -hmm. out to vote as well. So mm -hmm. Do you think you're going to take that credit as well? Well, I can only say that we have contributed. Okay. We have contributed to all the positive Wise or some of the positive things which has happened to okay. the Election Commission of Pakistan nice. in the past few years. Uh, I cannot take uh, the full credit for that because I think the credit goes to the Election Commission of Pakistan. And we then are to the, the leadership of the political parties. And then parties, to the yeah. leadership of the political parties, yeah. of course. I think the, the, the political leaders we have seen in the last few years have been very, very proactive in implementing the electoral reform. Exactly. The issues are out in the open. They are being debated by the people of Pakistan and of course at the TV channels and yeah. other places as well. So I think we have facilitated some of that and I think we are very proud to have facilitated some of that. No, that is great. But my, uh, the original thing which I asked was voter education. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, I might have seen quite a lot of times that, you know, you guys need to go out, mm -hmm. text messages on my cell phone. That mm -hmm. obviously includes mm -hmm. voter education or probably is a part of voter education. Mm -hmm. But do you think that in certain years, because in 2018, we're going to see historical elections as well? Yes. Yeah, so are you going to plan something for that as well? Because on the, you know, the supply side, obviously you have to build the capacity of election commission and then the parliament as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that, you know, all of these things are going to go hand in hand? Because people have already started preparing for 2018. I think two efforts. Uh, first of all, uh, we will work and we are working with the Election Commission of Pakistan yep. to enhance their voter education efforts. Yes. Because as you've seen in the past election, it is the Election Commission which takes the lead in voter education. Okay. Then I think voter education, I wouldn't say, is, is confined to one institution. Okay. It starts from the civil society of Pakistan to the parliament of Pakistan to individual one-on-one -on -one contact to the TV and and media channels yeah. and I think interpersonal communications. So our efforts, uh, specifically UNDP, would be with the Election Commission of Pakistan and the civil society organizations, yeah. which are there, uh, you know, uh, closer uh, to the people. Then, of course, I think indirectly the efforts we are doing with the local governments okay. and the, uh, the work we're doing with local governments do contribute to voter education because one is targeted voter education which is like running advertisements uh, or uh, taking out uh, you know media I campaigns. get it I get it yeah okay the other bit of voter education which I like to say is political awareness and I think that comes, you know, through the political parties. And, and, we've and seen, you know, the political awareness all over the place in Pakistan. I mean, I at times, you know, whenever I sit at like eight or nine for the television, I just want to throw the remote into the television because that's too much political awareness anyways. <laughs> so yeah. I think we need to calm down with that. Okay, now moving on to, towards rule of law. Now over here in Pakistan, we have this generic idea. I'm sorry that I'm <laughs> saying it, but I have to be honest with my profession as well. They say that, you know, the one who's rich, rule of law obviously is going to reside by his side. Hmm. So what are you doing in that aspect? 
I would, uh, with your permission, Shazad, I sure. would like to focus on one component, which Go is ahead. which is which is debated very less, but is very very important. Go ahead. We have seen enormous efforts for rule of law in Pakistan in the past few years. Yes. We have seen, you know, the police force, the judiciary, the others, you know, they have they have covered miles and ground. Exactly. One thing I think we need to focus more is and that, that is. one thing is the inst rule of law institutions providing services. The second part is the people of Pakistan or the people having confidence in rule of law institutions. Exactly. And I think that is the bit where we all need to work more. I think that is the bit where we all need to contribute because we may have the best law enforcement agency, but we not ha may not have people going to them to seek, you know, uh, relief. So I think that is that is one effort where I think I would, uh, my message, you know, to most of our colleagues, government, others, you know, we need to uh, develop institutions, but we need to reach out to the people. Exactly, to and I think that's something which the institutions need to do, but sir, you know, I'm very sorry, I'm very afraid to do that, but ladies and gentlemen, we've run out of time. I had several other things to talk, I mean, for example, to choose your representatives freely and then electoral reforms and then, you know, Within even law, we haven't seen major reforms since 1908. I mean, that's that goes way back. And whenever we talk about institutions being inclusive, that means that, you know, obviously they reach out to people as well. Mm. They reach out to communities, being socially responsible. Mm. But Amir Saab, thank you very much for coming over. We're going to have you on the show again, and you have to promise me you'll come, right? I will. Thank okay. you. Very. Thank you very much for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that, you know, I think it sums it up properly. But there's our responsibility within all of this, and that is that obviously we need to play our role. So, do not forget to write to us on our Facebook fan page, which is with the name of World This Morning. On Twitter, it's World This Morning without a G. On Daily Motion and YouTube, yeah, it's World This Morning once again. So, and uh, don't forget to catch the repeat at 5 past 11 p.m. Till the next time. One, two, three. Good morning.